And glory to Jesus Christ. Slava Jesus Christu. And I hope everybody had a great summer. We haven't seen you guys in a while. Um, I'm just going to give a couple of brief announcements here tonight and then do a presentation on the Philokalia. So um, this Thursday at uh, 7 p.m., we are going to be returning to um, our conversation with um, Bishop Brian Beta. And um, Bishop Brian is going to be welcoming on um, Father Peter Shemelda. And the two of them are going to be talking about uh, the end times. And uh, as many of, I've had many conversations over the last few months asking people, do you think we're in the end times? Do you, some people think we are, some people think we're not. Um, so Bishop Brian's going to be talking about um, how to determine whether or not we are in the end times. And um, we are also going to be hearing from Father Peter Schumelda, who is going to be talking to us about um, the book of Revelation. So I hope you can join us on Thursday evening. And other than that, we are also going to be continuing with our programming, uh, kids programs and other spiritual content. Tonight, I'm going to be presenting a uh, presentation on the Philokalia. Um, if you like our programming, please um, subscribe to our Eastern Catholic YouTube channel. All of our content, all of the priests, Bishop Brian Beta, myself, um, everyone, Larissa Samborski, who's involved in this, we're all Eastern Catholics. Uh, we have some Orthodox friends join us, some Protestants, um, but primarily we're, we're geared towards an Eastern Catholic audience. Uh, we're Tranquilite Calling, and please subscribe to our YouTube channel and like our videos. Thank you. Uh, like I said, we're going to be returning to kids programming. Uh, we'll have the conversation on Thursdays. We're not going to be doing it every week. Uh, we will be doing it probably once a month, uh, once or twice a month. Um, it was just becoming a little bit too top heavy for us to organize all of it. Uh, we'll be having, and in the past, we've had conversations on mental health, Mother Teresa, icons, and Eastern Christian spirituality. Tonight, we are going to have a presentation by yours truly, by myself, on um, uh, St. Philotheos of Sinai. And St. Philotheos is uh, one of the uh, fathers of the Philokalia. It's in volume three of the Philokalia. And um, yes, the presentation is by me, Subdeacon Sean Goldman. The photo here is a photo of the um, monastery in uh, Sinai that is known as the St. Catherine's Monastery. It's actually a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's one of the oldest monasteries in the world that has been uh, continually inhabited. Uh, today, I believe that there are mostly Greek Orthodox monks who are there. Um, and, uh, and I visited there. I know a few other people who have as well. It's an amazing place. The Sinai itself is an amazing place to visit uh, for its natural, tough beauty. And um, why don't we begin with a prayer in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Beneath your tender heart, we seek refuge, O Mother of God. Reject not our cries in this time of need, but deliver us from danger. O only pure and blessed one. So the Philokalia, I'm just going to move my picture around here. The Philokalia is a compilation of monastic spiritual writings dating from the fourth to the 15th century. So it covers about a thousand years. All of the authors were Greek speaking monks, except for John Cassian in volume one, who was Latin speaking. They lived in North Africa, the Sinai Peninsula, Palestine, Israel. Syria, Byzantium, and Mount Athos, so sort of that eastern end of the Mediterranean. The four-volume edition we're using was compiled by two Greek monks in the 18th century. Simultaneously, a Ukrainian monk, St. Pazius Velichkovsky, translated some of these manuscripts into Slavonic and had them published as the Dobrotolubie. The, the Slavonic version was carried by the pilgrim in the 19th century classic, The Way of a Pilgrim. And there's a link to it at the bottom there. It's actually a YouTube audio book of the way of the pilgrim. Now you're probably wondering why T.S. Eliot is here. Callistos Ware, who's one of the translators of the version we're doing, um, once told the story that he and the other translators 
came to Faber and Faber sometime in the 1950s, and they presented them with these manuscripts. And uh, Faber and Faber said, well, why would anybody in their right mind want to read uh, medieval Greek monks, right? So T.S. Eliot took the manuscript home, he read them, and he came back to the editorial board and said, no, we must translate these. So thank you, T.S. Eliot, for um, persisting. And, and it went, the, the, these books went on to be one of Faber and Faber's largest um, sellers over the last half a century or more. It's more than half a century now. Um, so the full title of the Philokalia is the Philokalia of the Neptic or Watchful Saints gathered from our Holy Theophoric Fathers, through which by means of the philosophy of ascetic practice and contemplation, the intellect is purified, illumined, and made perfect. So just a couple of things that I want to point out here are um, that we have this term neptic, and it's, it's related to nepsis or uh, watchfulness. And, and we will be talking quite a bit tonight about um, watchfulness, but you can see that this is the full title, as the full title of the Philokalia, this topic of nepsis or watchfulness is very important for the uh, fathers of the Philokalia. The other thing to point out here is that this is, it says here, by means of uh, the philosophy of both ascetic practice, so ascetic practice would be, you know, fasting and uh, battling with the passions. We'll talk quite a bit about the passions later on, as well as and contemplation. So contemplation is also a part of what they're calling the, uh, the, the philosophy here that they're dealing with. So by means of ascetic practice and contemplation, the intellect is purified, illumined, and made perfect. So we, we embark upon uh, deepening our spiritual lives through ascetic, asceticism and contemplation. Now, really, what they're talking about when they're talking about contemplation is watchfulness. Contemplation is watchfulness for the Eastern Fathers. And um, so I, I think we all need to keep in mind that th this topic of watchfulness, the topic of nepsis, is very central for the entire philokalia, but especially for the father who we are dealing with tonight in volume three, and it's um, St. Philotheos. As you can see him here, he's the chap on the right. The fellow in the middle is Hesychios. And John Climacus is uh, the fellow on the, um, the left side there. Climacus's writings are not included in the Philokalia. Uh, that's because they are really uh, seen as probably the most important text for Eastern Christian spirituality. It's the Ladder of Divine Ascent. That's a standalone text that is often read during Lent. But you can see how I pointed out here at the bottom, um, all three of these fathers deal with the Jesus prayer, with watchfulness, and the practice of remembrance of death. So we will we will look at all three of these practices here tonight. So some of the themes in Philotheos and some of the themes I'm going to be dealing with tonight are, um, first of all, the goal of spiritual life. We will talk about the soul's wounding uh, through the fall. We will talk about the passions. What are they? Um, and then we will look at what St. Philotheos puts forward as, and he has like probably about 14 or 15 healing remedies for the soul in, in this short text. It's not very long. It's just 20 or so pages, but it's packed with great material. And the final section for tonight's uh, presentation is going to be on watchfulness, which is that contemplative practice. We'll look at what it means. And what he calls, he calls it the place of the intellect or the place of the mind, the place of awareness. Um, the, the fellow in the picture here is um, Ontario author and artist, Michael O'Brien. I discovered Michael's artwork over the summer and uh, I, I've included it in the presentation tonight. He's a great writer. And I actually just today in the mail, I got one of his new books. Well, it's not that new, but it's, um, it's new for me. And it's called The Apocalypse, A Warning, Hope and Consolation. So I hope, um, I'll try to read it before Thursday for our conversation with Bishop Ryan. Um, so all of the passages from the Philokalia, you'll see I've written in parentheses, like the number three down here. 
And uh, my presentation is not really linear. I'm not just reading through uh, St. Philotheos, but I'm actually going to, um, I rejigged his work to give it more of a narrative form. And, and we will pause at certain points to reflect as well as to, to pray silently. So a couple of assumptions that I'm making just before we start. One is that the teachings of the Philokalia fall within the context of the great tradition of the church which includes scripture, sacraments, ecumenical councils, iconography, hagiography, and liturgics. So these writings aren't really meant to be taken on their own. It's not like picking up Eckhart Tolle's book and just kind of reading it. Um, these, these writings are meant for you know, practicing Christians who are immersed in the prayer life, the communal life, the sacramental life of the church. And I think that it should, that should be taken into context. Uh, and it also means that Philotheos, for, for him, the, the, you know, his, his writings were within the context of the church as well. Um, so the second point I want to make is that these writings are relevant for the 21st century. They're not just an intellectual curiosity, but they are uh, relevant as a living spiritual tradition that can help us on our path to personal healing and a deeper relationship with God. If we don't do this personal work, God will remain an abstraction. And that's an essential point. Those are my words, but that's an essential point that all of these fathers are making. We need to start engaging in this kind of spiritual work. So part one. Uh, so part one, so we're dealing with uh, St. Philotheos of Sinai, and we're talking about volume three of the Philokalia. Volume, part one, the goal of spiritual life. There is within us on the noetic plane, a warfare tougher than that on the plane of the senses. So already he's making it clear that we're talking about the plane, the noetic plane means the plane of the mind, the plane of consciousness. Um, it's not something supernatural. We're not talking above the human being. We're talking about on the plane of consciousness, the plane of the mind. The spiritual worker has to press on with his mind towards the goal in order to enshrine perfectly the remembrance of God in his heart, like some pearl or precious stone, to possess God alone in the heart. To possess God alone in the heart. That is the goal of spiritual life. From dawn, we should stand bravely at the gate of the heart with true remembrance of God and unceasing prayer of Jesus Christ in the soul. So it's really about an interior approach to, um, to finding God where, where we, we will engage in uh, the passions, we will engage in finding a space within the heart to find our relationship with God. He continues um, all through his text, but here's a beautiful passage um, showing us how St. Philotheos really looks to our interior life um, to find our connection with God. At every hour and moment, let us guard the heart with all diligence from thoughts that obscure the soul's mirror. The soul's mirror. For in that mirror, Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God the Father, is typified and luminously reflected. So within the soul, God is reflected to our conscious mind. And let us unceasingly seek the kingdom of heaven inside our heart, for the kingdom of heaven is within you. The mustard seed, the pearl, and the leaven. Indeed, if we cleanse the eye of the soul, we will find all things hidden within us. This is why the Lord Jesus Christ said that the kingdom of heaven is within us, indicating that divinity dwells within our hearts. Central theme here, that divinity dwells within our hearts. It's very scriptural. You can see here that St. Philotheos is referring to some of the parables of Christ. It's also uh, within clearly within the writings of St. Paul. The mysticism of St. Paul is an, an interior mysticism where one finds God within the soul. And I love this um, sort of iconographic presentation 
of St. Joseph holding the Christ child. But, but if we look at it through the lens of St. Philotheos, we could say, well, here is St. Joseph looking into his heart, looking into his soul, uh, cleansing his heart and soul in order to have the Christ child reflected back to him. I'll just touch briefly on, on how St. Philotheos is interpreting scripture. So he uses these parables. Um, we'll just pick one. Say, Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will tre have treasure in heaven. So in all three of these parables that do come up in St. Philotheos, um, you know, or, or the middle one, they get the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of pearls, fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value, which is the remembrance of God in heart, according to St. Philotheos, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So we find this theme of selling all that he has. And, and we often tend to interpret it literalistically and saying, oh, I got to give up my car and my TV and my fridge and, and all my belongings and my family and everything else. Well, St. Philotheos would like St. John of the Cross in, in the, um, the Carmelite Order of the West, he would interpret this as you need to give up your, um, your thoughts, the thoughts that are distracting you from finding God in the soul. Okay. So it's not, it's not going to help you necessarily to give up all your belongings, What you need to give up, sell all you have is really selling the, the mental distractions that we have. Okay, so that's how they they would interpret it the, in, in terms of the, the way of contemplation means that we're we're looking for God in the soul and we need to worry about what kinds of thoughts are coming into our consciousness. So we're talking about the soul. Well, why don't we clarify what Philotheos, as many of the other fathers of the church uh, in the Philokalia think about the soul. So so this image that I'm showing it, it's a Greek uh, urn, and uh, really the image of the soul that we're talking about was taken by the fathers of the church and imported into uh, the Christian tradition from the philosophic tradition of the ancient Greeks. So the tripartite soul from Greek philosophy has three parts. There's the intellect, and we're really, sometimes it's translated as the mind, the, in the Philokalia they use the word intellect. It's, we're really talking not, not just about our discursive mind, but we're talking about our awareness. The second part is the insensive part of the soul. And that's really the emotions. And the third part is the appetitive part, which is our desires. The awareness was meant to govern or to rule over the two steeds of emotion and desire, but it was overthrown at the fall. Okay, so there's this, so the charioteer is our awareness, um, and, you know, including our mind, our discursive mind and our memory and everything else. But it, it's so maybe we could, you know, in, in modern language, sometimes you hear the term executive functioning, right? So we're meant to rule over the two horses of emotion and desire. Unfortunately, because of the fall, the charioteer loses the reins of the horses and they're pulling this way and that way and this way and that way. He's still there. He's still on the chariot, but he can't control where the chariot is going. So remember, the goal for Philotheos is to enshrine perfectly the remembrance of God in the heart. And that reclaiming of the, um, the proper place of awareness in, in the person is what's going to bring order to the soul, to emotion and desire. And it is also what is going to bring um, the ability to enshrine perfectly the remembrance of God in the heart. So here we're talking about the fall. And I love this image. Uh, it's a very interesting image of the fall, Adam and Eve sort of embracing each other there in the fall. And you can see the serpent is sort of like, you know, like hissing at them almost, right? Like, like the moment where he's whispering and, and even their bodies, they're, they're distorted, they're contorted. Um, but the wonderful thing to notice about the image is the, um, the two hands of Christ that are, are, you know, you can see the blood ensuing from both of them, but, but, but it's almost as if the, um, the blood of Christ is what's catching them 
from falling further into sin. So here we have from passage 30 in St. Philotheos, forcing his way into our intellect or our awareness. Our enemy, who is Satan, tries to compel us, created in God's image though we are, to eat the dust and to creep on our bellies, as he does. And, and so li literally, we're not talking about, you know, because of the fall, we're crawling around on all fours, but our thoughts have sunk to a very low level. And if you look at, if you look at television or movies or advertising, um, in the modern world, our thoughts are, are exposed to a lot of vulgarity. A lot of the time, they're very base thoughts. We don't think a lot of, of heavenly matters, of godly matters. Um, this is why God says, I will put enmity between you and him. Hence, we must always breathe God. What an amazing phrase. We must always breathe God so that we are never wounded by the devil's fiery darts. I shall protect him, he says, because he has known my name and his salvation is near to those who fear him. So we'll touch upon the issue of breathing God in a moment, but I just want to look at the last two psalms, phrases from the psalms that he brings in and just point out that the Lord is saying to us, I shall protect him because he has known my name. And in the very next psalm, he's using the term, his salvation is near to those who fear him. Well, in, in the original Hebrew of the psalms, which perhaps the fathers knew, or perhaps the Greek reflects this as well, my name, the Lord says in the first Psalm, he says, because he has known my name. Well, salvation is the Lord's name. Salvation, the English word salvation, translated into Hebrew as um, Yeshua, right? Salvation is the Lord's name because it's Jesus. Yeshua is Jesus. And I love how even though in the midst of describing this tragedy of the fall, he gives us a remedy. He's, oh, he's, he's such a great doctor, such a great therapist, such a great healer of the human soul. And right in the middle of this passage, he says, we must always breathe God. So let's do that for a moment, for 20 seconds even, less than a minute. We'll just, just sit and contemplate the image, the image of the ascension, and just breathe God. So he continues on describing our fallen state in passage 19. The soul is walled off, fenced in, and bound with chains of darkness by the demonic spirits. Because of the surrounding darkness, she cannot pray as she wants to, for she is fettered inwardly, and her inner eyes are blind. Only when she begins to pray to God and to acquire watchfulness while praying. That's the key here, to acquire watchfulness or attentiveness or guarding of the heart while praying. Will she be freed from this inner darkness through prayer? Otherwise, she will remain a prisoner. Oops, I didn't mean to go on there. Okay. Um, so he recognizes that there's been this disruption in the human soul it affects our cognitive functioning and our minds become scattered. They become darkened, as he says, uh, become blind, blind to what? Blind to spiritual reality, blind to what reality actually is. You know, we become narcissistic. We become self-involved. Um, um, we're, we're egocentric. We are trying to just fulfill our own basic needs. And we lock God and other people out of the process. Partly this is happening and partly those steeds of emotion and desire are running this way and that because we don't 
we have lost the ability to focus in a very real way. And in this modern age, in the 21st century of social media, that's becoming worse and worse a problem. It is through prayer that we will be healed, according to St. Philothaus. So again, just take a moment, pray the Jesus prayer through once, but really focus on it to acquire watchfulness. That means bring your attention to it. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. So we're going to do the deep dive now into how these evil thoughts disrupt the soul, disrupt mind, uh, disperse our consciousness, right? How does, how does this happen? So the enemy, evil thoughts, how Satan wages war. The enemy in his turn tries to stir up strife and thoughts of rancor and envy within us. For he too knows that the intelligence should control the sense of power. The mind should be in control of the emotions, the sense of power is the emotions. And so by bombarding the intelligence, intelligence is the mind. The Greek term is nous. That's the term they use in Greek. Bombarding the intelligence of our consciousness with evil thoughts, with thoughts of envy, strife, contention, guile, vainglory, he persuades the intelligence to abandon its control, right? And isn't that what happens when we're overwhelmed with emotion? To hand the reins over to the sense of power. And, and that, in this case, it's all of these emotions that are, that are standing around the, the, the mind and to let the latter go unchecked. And the sense of power, having unseated its rider, disgorges through the mouth in the form of words, all those things stored up in the heart as a result of the devil's wiles and the intellect's negligence. And the heart is then seen to be full, not of the divine spirit and of godlike thoughts, but of evil. It is, as the Lord said, the mouth expresses what fills the heart. So when we're not engaged in proper prayer, which is prayer that is watchful and attentive, and we'll look more closely later on at what that is, when we're not engaged in the proper access um, process of prayer, the heart becomes, the heart, meaning the deeper levels of consciousness, and maybe we could even say the unconscious storehouse, becomes filled with these angry and resentful emotions. And then suddenly, when there's an opportunity, when, when, when the mind loses control over the emotions, that's when all of that storehouse of evil comes out into the world. And for those who do not have an adequate spiritual practice in their lives, and there are many different spiritual practices, but this one is talking specifically about cleansing out the unconscious storehouse of emotions. If we don't engage in that kind of process, at some point it'll erupt into the world and wreak havoc on people. It is through us that Satan fights God. So, for the fathers of the church, there really was a being called Satan. Um, you know, many modern people don't believe in him, but he was very real for the fathers. But, you know, Satan and the demons aren't always depicted in the, father, in the writings of the fathers as spirits floating around in the air. They are also seen as these um, distorted thoughts that exist within the heart. So how do we heal anger, which is the incentive or emotional part of the soul? Here, what Father, what uh, St. Philotheos tells us is, Note how Christ says, whoever is angry with his brother without good cause will be brought to judgment. And then he tells us how anger may be healed. For it is the devil, uh, for if the devil can induce the person he has taken possession of to utter what is harbored within, then that person will not merely call his brother dolt or fool, but may well pass from insulting words to murder. And we see this in scripture, right? Adam and Eve, the fall, the very next generation, we see murder come into the world. 
It is in these ways that the devil fights against God and the commandment God gave about not being angry with one's brother. But the insulting words and their consequences could have been avoided had their initial provocations been expelled from the heart through prayer and attentiveness. Attentiveness is another word for watchfulness. Thus, the devil achieves his purpose when he makes us break God's commandment by means of the thoughts that he insinuates into the heart. The devil achieves his purpose when he makes us break God's commandment by means of the thoughts he insinuates. So, so really, what the fathers see that these thoughts are being kind of brought into us um, from Satan and the demons. But maybe it's, you know, Facebook. Maybe it's television. Maybe it's the movies we're watching. And uh, they rest there in the heart. So if we're not engaged in the practice of cleansing the heart, they're going to they're gonna start to fester down there. How does the devil attack the desiring or appetitive aspect of the soul? What does the Lord command where the appetitive aspect or desiring power of the soul is concerned? Whoever looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. The devil weaves a kind of net to under, undermine its effect. He does not attack us by exciting desires through an actual physical woman, but he operates inwardly by projecting into our intellect las lascivious figures and images and by insinuating words that rouse desire. So, a, you know, even in the case of lust and desire. So, so again, remember the three parts of the soul, there's the, 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 the mind, the noose, the intellect, consciousness that is meant to rule over the emotions and desire. So here he's talking about desire for a woman. And again, you can see the interior focus of Philotheos's writing that, that our lustful desires begin from within and they begin, you know, similarly to when we were talking about anger, that when we don't take account of what is going on in our interior life, our, those emotions start to rule our, our thoughts and our behavior as well. So we've, we've mentioned the passions, we've mentioned how um, these um, thoughts, these distorted thoughts come into our lives. So, what, so we'll just take a pause from Philotheus for a moment and look at what the passions are. So this is part three of the presentation. By diverting the different faculties of his soul and body from God, so when we move away from God and by orienting them, all of our faculties of the mind and the soul to sense, to sense reality in order to seek pleasure, a person causes the passions to be born in him. Okay, so these distorted emotions and desires are, are formed in us. When we, when we lose our relationship with God. And that's precisely what happened during the fall. Uh, and that passage, which is quite, I think, quite good at describing what the passions are, is from the French Orthodox theologian, Jean-Claude Larcher. Uh, Matthew, uh, Jesus tells us that, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a man, right? So for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These defile a man. St. Paul in Romans. So the first chapter of Romans, the, this passage from Larche about, you know, losing our focus on God and focusing on sense reality for pleasure. That's really what the first chapter of Romans is all about. The fall leads to the rise of the passions. God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature instead of the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. What causes wars and what causes fighting among you? Is it not your passions that are at war in your members? You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So we can see in, in all of the fathers, in you know, St. Paul, St. Peter talks about this, uh, St. James, uh, scripture itself, the, it's a 
fundamental aspect of Christian life to come to terms with how we are addicted to our own passions. A few more passages from scripture. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come. But this is Jesus talking at Matthew. For it is necessary that temptations come. They will come. But woe to the man by whom the temptation comes. And then again from James. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. Among these, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of body and mind. And so we were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. So when we, when we follow the passions, we are fallen human beings. For the grace of God has appeared for the salvation of all men, training us to renounce irreligion and worldly passions and to live sober, upright, and godly lives in this world. Fascinating passage from Titus that reminds us of what St. Paul talks about in the first chapter of Romans. Um, but it's not that, we should not be thinking that irreligion or false religion and worldly passions are separate things that are both wrong and we need to correct them. They're related. So remember what St. Paul says, when we take our focus off of God, that's when the passions arise. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this chart, but uh, the, this idea of the passions was take, taken up by the early um, desert fathers. Evagrius compiled this list of eight. He never meant for this list of eight to be exhaustive, but he does see it as sort of um, a way. It, it's really a teaching tool and a way for us to um, think about the, the basic passions. You see, there's three that are focused on the body, gluttony, lust, greed. And there's three that are focused on emotion, sadness, anger, and acidia. Uh, and then two that are focused on the ego, vainglory and pride. So just a, just a word on the flesh, this term flesh, because many of us moderns, we get, we're, we're troubled when we hear, you know, St. Paul talking about how we need to struggle with the flesh and, then, you know, but the, the scripture in St. Paul used two terms, flesh and body. The flesh is not the body. The flesh is the fallen, this fallen aspect of our nature that composed of these desires and emotions. Lord, I shall see you no more with the eyes of the flesh. That's St. John of the Cross. So the flesh, the Greek word for flesh is sarx, whereas the Greek word for body is soma. So we have these two words in scripture and we can see that they're different, right? They mean different things. Sarx indicates the fallen body's desires that are dissociated from God. So, there, so, so Sarx really refers not to, so much to the physical body, but it refers to these emotions and desires. Soma indicates the body that was created by God. And in 1 Corinthians, and we know from Genesis that everything that God created is good. But uh, in St. Paul tells us that the body is not meant for immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Your bodies are members of Christ. So, so the whole notion that Christianity is anti-body is um, a misinterpretation of what the tradition really tells us. And, but, but we read in 1 Peter Beloved, I beseech you as aliens and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh that wage war against your soul. So the passions are these distorted emotions and desires that are, are constantly tempting us. Like, oh, okay, you know, I've just had a steak and, and a giant piece of apple pie, but oh, it was so good. I just want one more piece, you know. <laughs> like it's when we're dealing with that kind of thing, um, overeating, gluttony. That, those are the passions, right? So that, that's the flesh, right? Um, and it, that's not the physical body that was created by God that is meant to be a temple. I mean, also in 1 Corinthians, God, uh, uh, St. Paul says, you know, don't you know that your, temp your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? So here we go back to Philotheos, and we'll talk about this noetic war, the war that is being fought on the level of consciousness. 
Such then is the strategy employed by the evil demons in their war against both those who are monks and those who are not. I'm just going to pause there for a moment and really reflect on what he's saying here. That, yes, this struggle, th these texts were written by monks and usually for monks, but that doesn't mean that this struggle is only a struggle for monks and nuns and priests and deacons and, and everybody else in the church, but it's really meant for all, all of us. And, and he says, those who are not monks, right? So those who are not monks also have this struggle. And the issue is either defeat or victory, as we have said. So let us wage noetic war against the demons, lest we translate their evil purposes into sinful actions. Let us cut sin out of our heart, and we will find within us the kingdom of heaven. Let us cut sin out of our heart, and we will find within us the kingdom of heaven. And I love this, just such a beautiful kind of archetypal image that we're looking at. But it also, the, the, the phrase here, let us cut sin out of our heart, and we will find within us the kingdom of heaven. You know, it makes us think that you know we're meant to be our own heart surgeons, our spiritual heart surgeons, to cut these passions out, to simply get rid of them. You know. Okay, feel a theos on how evil thoughts turn to sin. The person who gives himself over to evil thoughts, the passions, cannot keep his outer self free from sin. And if evil thoughts have not been uprooted from the heart, they are bound to manifest themselves in evil actions. We look upon things adulterously because the inner eye has become adulterous and darkened. And we want to hear about foul things because our soul's ears have listened to what the foul demons inside us have whispered to us. Consequently, with the Lord's help, we must cleanse ourselves within and without. We must guard our senses and free each of them from impassioned and sinful influences. So we must constantly be on guard. So he talks about how these, um, these interior thoughts, the passions, can lead to sin. And so he has, like many of the other fathers of the Philokalia, um, he has these stages, or also we can think of them as states of mind where the mind is engaging with its own thoughts in a certain kind of way. Uh, St. John of Damascus uh, has actually seven, he elaborates into seven different stages. And I think some of the other fathers even go as high as 11 or so. But, but here, his, uh, so Philotheus is keeping it easy for us. He's only got these five states of mind. The first one is provocation. It's when a thought or image is introduced to the mind it is still free from passion. No sin is incurred here. So the thought is just introduced. It could be a thought of a, you know, um, a giant uh, a hunk of chocolate, or it could be the thought of people, uh, you know, uh, giving us a lot of praise and, 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 and fawning our egos, right? So um, there's no sin in here. Uh, and the sources of these thoughts could be memory, sense experience, or as the fathers believe, demonic provocation that the demons are throwing these thoughts into our head the second form of thought or a stage of provocation that he's talking about is called coupling coupling is to interact with the thought or image in either an impassioned or dispassionate way so that means you know the thought is there so at the first level of provocation you know that's probably if you know if you're having thoughts of you know your neighbor undressing that's probably when you should like just get rid of the thought right but some of sometimes we interact with the thought and that's when the trouble starts right still there's no sin involved here but we are we're we're allowing ourselves to be led into temptation the third uh, aspect of provocation is called assent and assent is the pleasurable acceptance by the soul of the thing seen. This often involves sin. So assent is when, it, when, you're, when you're agreeing to what's going on in, in this little image or fantasy that's being played out in your head. Captivity is the forcible abandonment of the heart center. It involves persistent and obsessive intercourse with the object, object disrupting our communion with the Lord. 
So we should be at prayer. We should be you know, calm, centered, and thinking of God, having godly thoughts. What happens though, and godly thoughts isn't, you know, I'm not, I'm not being facetious when I say that, but you know, our godly thoughts we can have when we're interacting with, with our neighbors. And we can have these thoughts that are loving thoughts, but not lustful thoughts, right? So, but what happens when we give our assent to these um, desires or emotions, we, we abandon that heart center. We abandon the deeper center of who we are, and we start running after these passionate thoughts. And five, I love how he describes the term passion. Passion is that which lurks in the soul over a long period and has grown habitual and continuous. It lurks in the soul, right? It could be, you know, the passion. It could be our egocentrism. It's lurking there in the soul. We're looking for opportunities for people to give us praise or for people to tell us how wonderful we are. We're looking for opportunities to steal money. You know, that could be a passion. Um, our love of money or objects, and it could lead to, th to theft. All of these things, all of these passions are, are you know, are des simply our desire for pleasure on any, on, in any way, shape, or form, which could take, could be, you know, alcohol, drugs, sex. And it's, so that it's lurking there. It, it, it's not that the, the actual experience is lurking there, but our desire for the pleasure is lurking over a long period. And it has grown habitual and continuous. Well, I think that this sounds like addiction to me. So that I think the fathers, when they're talking about their passions, they are talking about addictions and, and, and they're giving us some methods to heal from them. Uh, Dr. Gay Burma is, is an expert on addictions and he's written an amazing book called The Realm of Hungry Ghosts. And I'm just going to read a short pas a passage from it because I think it really dovetails with what we're talking about here today. Addiction is a complex psychophysiological process, but it has a few key components. I'd say that an addiction manifests in any behavior that a person finds temporary pleasure or relief in and therefore craves, suffers negative consequences from, and has trouble giving up. Well, those, you know, that's, Sounds a lot. Philotheos was saying that um, it, it that it manifests in the behavior, right? But it starts before that in, in in the interiority of the soul, and there's negative consequences when it manifests in behavior. That's sin, and sin invites negative consequences into our lives. So there's craving, relief, and pleasure in the short term, and negative outcomes in the long term, along with an inability to give it up. It's lurking there in the soul, and we want it. That's what an addiction is. Note that this definition says nothing about substances. While addiction is often to substances, it could be to anything. To religion, to sex, to gambling, to shopping, to eating, to the internet, to relationships, to work, even to extreme sports. So really, these passions can manifest themselves in any place in our lives. The issue with the addiction is not the, the external activity, but the internal relationship to it. And that internal relationship is precisely what Philotheos was just talking about in those five different stages of how the, the passions manifest themselves. Thus, one person's passion is another's addiction. Now, I know that Gabor Mate is not using passion and the term passion in the same way that the fathers do, but I think that this passage you know the modern research modern research into the into addictions um, really would benefit from looking at these church fathers and uh, talking about how they looked at the passions and and each and every one of them does it's not just Philotheos it goes right back to the beginning to Evagrius to Saint Anthony to all of them noetic warfare keeping watch with the intellect. We should slaughter all the sinners of the land. Pretty extreme. Given over in the intensity of our ecstasy to the constant remembrance of God, we should, 
for the Lord's sake. Cut off all the heads of the tyrants. Oh, that's even more extreme. That is to say, we should destroy hostile thoughts. Oh, phew, relief. At their first appearance. That, so the heads of the thought, the head of the, the tyrant is really that first stage. Remember, just when the thought appears. Um, for in noetic warfare too, there is a certain order and practice. So, uh, you know, let the passions aside, let's just look at how, you know, Philotheos is talking about scripture, how he's interpreting scripture, and he's interpreting it on the noetic plane, right? The plane of consciousness. So it's not that we need to go out there and start killing sinners. No, that's not what he's advocating. He's talking about these thoughts, these passions, these emotions and desires that we know are going to lead to negative consequences in our lives. And we need to cut them off um, right when they appear. And we cut them off how well we return our thoughts to God. We sing the Jesus prayer and, and he has many other remedies and we'll look at them very shortly. Um, before we head on to the remedies, I want to look at a passage that I found quite fascinating. It's, it's related to monks and individuals who do not uh, want to look within, who do not want to look at the darkness within and, and, and the passions that are living within them. Many monks are not aware of how the demons deceive the intellect, being naive and undeveloped. They tend to give all their attention to the practice of the virtues and do not bother with their interior consciousness. In other words, they're virtue signaling, right? The mo I think we could use that modern term, virtue signaling. They want people to see how good they are. And they don't want to see how dark, how their own interior darkness. They move through life, I fear, without having tasted purity of heart and are totally ignorant of the passions within. Such people are unaware of the battle of which St. Paul speaks. Just return to that phrase for a moment. They are ignorant of the passions within. They're ignorant of their own egocentricity. They're ignorant of their own lusts. They're ignorant of their own, you know, desire. They're, they're so, you know, look, maybe even in, it would lead, maybe lead to, you know, sexual abuse or rape, God forbid. Um, but but when, we, when we ignore these interior passions, they can leap out at us with a vengeance and leap out at us in the world. And they're not imbued with the experience of true goodness. So true goodness is not about just virtue signaling. It's not just about saying, oh, I'm, I am such a virtuous person. True goodness is about when we can look interior at our own darkness and regard as lapses only those sins that are put into effect. So they only, they, so unlike Philotheos in those five stages that he had in those five different interior relationships to the passions, these people only only consider themselves as sinners when they have put those thoughts into action. They do not take into account the defeats and victories that occur on the plane of interior consciousness. For these, being internal, cannot be seen by natural sight and are known only to God, our judge, and to the conscience of the spiritual contestant. So basically, they're ignoring their interior life. I put this picture of Christ up, you know, when he, he gives us the command to pick up our crosses and to follow him. The, our crosses are not only external circumstances in our lives. Many of us have external crosses that are very difficult, but we also have our interior crosses to pick up. And those are, those are the passions. This passage that we just read really reminded me of the concept of the shadow that's found in Carl Jung. And here's a quote from Jung on the, on the shadow. Filling the conscious mind with ideal conceptions is a characteristic of Western philosophy, but not the confrontation with the shadow and the world of darks. One does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. And St. Philotheos likewise says, let us go forth with the heart completely attentive and the soul fully conscious, conscious of what's going on inside. And unfortunately, 
we still live in a culture, as Jung points out, that Western philosophy is not interested in doing this. And uh, we run into problems. We run into problems with individuals, with families, with society in general, because we're, we, we, we don't teach our children and we don't do it ourselves. We don't do this practice of looking within to see what we're struggling with. We're terrified of our interior lives. Okay, so just a little, we'll take just a little break so I can have a drink. And um, if you're liking what you're seeing, please subscribe to our channel and like the content. Um, we're gonna try to, we will, like I said, come back on Thursday with Bishop Brian Beta's call. Uh, we're gonna be talking about the end times with Father, Father Peter Shimelda in the book of Revelation. And um, I really hope that uh, you guys join us on Thursday and I hope you're enjoying tonight's uh, little program as well. Okay, so now we're, we're on to the next section of the presentation and this is really, um, it's not the last section, but it is part four. I know this is a long presentation here tonight, but there's a lot of really good content in Philotheos, and I wanted to present it to all of you. Um, so we're talking about now the remedies of the soul, and, and he's got such a great, great list. Um, like I said, he's got 14 or so, uh, even more. I added two here to this list. You can see the ones in black at the bottom. They're not in Philotheos. But they're very two important spiritual remedies, uh, having a spiritual father or mother. I should have written spiritual father or mother. And uh, a practice called the manifestation of thoughts. And I'll just mention that briefly, what it is. It's not confession, but it kind of looks like confession. So manifestation of thoughts is when we're talking to somebody, could be a monk, a nun, a priest, a, a wise lay person can do this. And what we're focusing on is not necessarily telling them our entire life story, but we're in a calm and meditative way. We are looking it within and, and we are seeing what are the passions we're dealing with. Okay. So you can see his list, the, the list up to 14, Philotheos's list is quite extensive. And we'll talk about a number of these uh, remedies from silence, fasting, remembrance of death, commandments, um, all the way through to watchfulness. So watchfulness will be the final section of tonight's presentation. And St. Philotheos says the following, do not reject out of, I added, narcissistic self-love. So he's talking about egocentrism, not a healthy regard for oneself. Do not reject out of narcissistic self-love these saving medicines of the soul. These saving medicines of the soul. If you do, you are no disciple of Christ or imitator. St. Paul. Wow, that is great advice, and we all need to hear it. <laughs> so the first remedy he mentions in, in passage six is the first gate of entry into the noetic Jerusalem, in other words, the Jerusalem of consciousness, that is to attentiveness of the mind, is the deliberate silencing of your tongue, even though the mind itself may not be still. So if we want to bring the mind to a place of stillness and quiet and focus, we should begin with our tongues. The second gate is balanced self-control in food and drink. So the second remedy is moderation in eating. St. Paul says, the person engaged in spiritual warfare exercises self-control in all things. For bound as we are to this flesh, which again is the desires, which always desires in a way that opposes the spirit. So these distorted emotions and, and desires, we cannot, when sated with food, stand firm against demonic principality. We're constantly shoving food in our face. And a lot of us are food addicts. I'm a food addict. Um, we cannot stand firm against the demonic principalities, against invisible and malevolent powers. For the kingdom of God is not food and drink, and the will of the flesh is hostile to God, for it is not subject to the law of God. Again, that's from Romans. Again, we're not, when we mention the flesh, we're not talking about the human body. It's not that the human body is hostile to God. It's these distorted, the, and by distorted, what I mean is that, you know, Let's use hunger. We're, what we're trying to do when we overeat 
is yes, we're seeking pleasure. But what we're also trying to do is fill up that mirror of the soul, the image of God that is within us. The image of God that is within us can only be satisfied not by apple pie, steaks, and sex, but it can only be satisfied by God. And why is that? Well, God is an, in, in, is an eternal being. He's an infinite being. And so if we're trying to shove pie into the place in our soul that is meant for an eternal being, it's not going to fill it up. And so we're, so, you know, people who are food addicts are like, I, I keep, I'm not satisfied. I'm not satisfied. Well, any kind of addict, you're never satisfied. And so it's a spiritual problem because God is an infinite being. We have a place in our soul, which is the image of God that is within us that needs to be filled by God and not by the passions. So the third remedy is the remembrance of death. The third is ceaseless mindfulness of death. For this purifies mind and body. Having once experienced the beauty of this mindfulness of death, I was so wounded and delighted by it that I wanted to make it my life's companion. For I was enraptured by its loveliness and majesty, its humility and contrite joy, by how full of reflection it is, how apprehensive of the judgment to come and how aware of life's anxieties. Passage six. Again, from passage six, remedy the remembrance of death. It makes life-giving healing tears flow from our bodily eyes, while from our noetic eyes, from our, from our consciousness, rises a fount of wisdom that delights the mind. This daughter of Adam, this mindfulness of death, I always long to have as my companion to sleep with, to talk to, and to inquire from her what will happen after the body is discarded. He who truly desires to redeem his life, always dwelling on the thought of death and withholding the noose, the mind, from the passions, is in a far better position to discern the continual presence of demonic provocations than the man who chooses to live without being mindful of death. The latter, in other words, the one who is not mindful of death, by purifying the heart through spiritual knowledge alone, but not keeping in mind any thought of grief, may sometimes appear to control all the destructive passions by his skill. Yet he is unwittingly fettered by one of them, the worst of all, pride into which, abandoned by God, he sometimes falls. Such a person must be very vigilant, lest, deluded by conceit, he becomes deranged. But he, who all the day long is mindful of death, discerns the assaults of the demons more keenly, and he counterattacks and repels them. So you can see that St. Philotheos thinks quite highly the practice of remembrance of death. Remember, this is one of the practices that is really unique to the Sinite school of hesychasm that includes both uh, St. Hierotheos and uh, St. John Climacus. Oh, I know it's a gruesome image, but stay with it for just a moment. I'm going to read from some scripture. Remember the end of your life and cease from enmity. Remember destruction and death and be true to the commandments. And that's from the book of Sirach in the Old Testament. This is the practice of what's known in the Western church as memento mori. Remember your death. It, the remembrance of death, as Philotheus was describing it, can crush the passions and especially pride. Because we realize we're not going to live forever. So there too, there's that, you know, the problem of eternity, right? In our fallen deluded state, we, imag we, we imagine a world without death. And so we're shocked by death and we're shocked by images of death. But the reality is we are going to die. 
we are finite. We need to come to terms with the problem of our finitude. And that's what the practice of the remembrance of death can give us. And so from Hebrews, we read, he himself likewise partook of the same nature that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage. You might even write in, at the end there, subject to lifelong bondage to the passions, to the flesh. So there's, there's a wonderful um, uh, Eastern Orthodox um, philosopher, theologian, um, Andrew Louth, who just passed away a few years ago. Uh, he's a really wonderful theologian. If you, if you want to start reading theology, I'd recommend his, his introduction to um, Orthodox theology. But he picks up on this passage in Hebrews and he says, this is the fundamental problem that it's through the fear of death that bondage or sin came into the world. Yes, St. Paul talks about the fact that it's through sin, sin leads to death. But perhaps it's our fear of death that leads us to seeking eternity amongst that which is not eternal. We, because we don't want to die, we, we stay here and we try to find eternity in sex, in our egocentrism, in our vanity, in, in money, in all sorts of things. And now it's important to point out that Catholics and Orthodox Christians do not worship death, but we remember it in order to overcome it. Another healing um, remedy that St. Philos Theos talks about is the healing commandments. It is evident that all the commandments of the gospel. So, so here we're not, we're not talking about prohibitions against pork in the Old Testament. We're talking about the commandments of the gospel. The commandments of the gospel legislate for the tripartite soul and make it healthy through what they enjoin. They do not merely seem to make it healthy, but they actually have this effect. The devil, on the other hand, fights day and night against the tripartite soul. But if he fights against it, it is clear that he fights against Christ's commandments, since Christ legislates for the tripartite soul through the commandments. So per perhaps the commandments of the Old Testament do as well, but it's more fundamentally the commandments of the New Testament that help to heal what he's calling here the tripartite soul. So that's the three parts of the soul, the mind, the emotions, and the desires. When we follow Christ, when we fundamentally follow Christ, we, we find that healing starts to come to our soul. So he also points out that there are commandments for what he calls the intellect, but it, you know, it's, it's the mind, it's our awareness, our consciousness. What commandments are directed at the intelligence, the noose, our awareness? I tell you, never swear an oath, but simply say yes or no. And he who does not renounce everything and follow me is not worthy of me. These are instructions to the intelligence, the noose. The intellect, consequently, should always be watchful. In this way, it maintains its natural state. Um, so a few things here. So first of all, on the bottom, he says that the intellect should always be watchful. And Jesus talks about watchfulness, doesn't he? He actually commands us to be watchful. And in this way, it will make, we maintain our natural state. When, when he quote, when Philotheus quotes the commandment of Christ from Matthew, when he says, he who does not renounce everything and follow me is not worthy of me. He goes on later, Philotheus goes on to, um, say that really what we're talking about here is renouncing these passionate thoughts in the interior life, right? So it's not, again, we don't have to give up all our belongings in order to get to heaven, but really we need to start discerning in our interior life between those thoughts which are going to lead us towards God and those thoughts which are not. And the ones that are not, those are the ones that we, Christ is referring to as saying, 
renounce everything and follow me. Renounce everything and follow me means renounce the, um, the thoughts that are taking us away from God. The remedy of the remembrance of Christ's passion. The detailed remembrance of our Lord's passion, the recollection of what he suffered, greatly humbles and abashes our pride. And this too produces tears. So you can see here too, I didn't include it as a separate one, but he's already mentioned a few times with the remembrance of death and now the remembrance of Christ's passion, the uh, production of tears. Tears is seen as a fundamental remedy. But you can see that there's a remedy that leads to a remedy and weeping is one of the most important remedies for the fathers of the Eastern Church. So here we have the imitation of Christ. With all our strength, let us hold fast to Christ, for there are always those who struggle to deprive our soul of his presence. And let us take care lest Jesus withdraws because of the evil thoughts that crowd our soul. Yet, we will not be able to hold him without great effort on the soul's part. Let us study his life in the flesh so that in our own life, we may be humble. Let us absorb his sufferings so that by emulating him, we may endure our afflictions patiently. Let us savor his ineffable incarnation and his work of salvation on our behalf so that from the sweet taste in our soul, we may know that the Lord is bountiful. Also, and above all, let us unhesitatingly trust in him and in what he says, and let us daily wait upon his providence towards us. If we do all these things, we are not far from God. For godliness is perfection that is never complete. Godliness is perfection that is never complete. I think that's one of the most brilliant lines ever written. And here we actually have St. Philotheus quoting from John Climacus. So we actually know historically that Philotheus comes after Climacus, but look at the impact that he's had on, you can see that Climacus's writing has infused um, all those who come after him. Godliness is perfection that is never complete. For us finite human beings, we can never know the fullness of God's being because we're finite. So here we're talking about now, the next remedy is the unceasing prayer of Jesus. When engaged in noetic warfare, we should do all we can to choose some spiritual practice from divine scripture and apply it to our intellect, to our mind, to our consciousness, like a healing ointment. From dawn, we should stand bravely and unflinchingly at the gate of the heart with true remembrance of God and unceasing prayer of Jesus Christ in the soul. That's supposed to be, um, I made a typo there. The remedy is not tillness. Uh, the remedy is stillness. Okay. It is very rare to find people whose intellect or mind is in a state of stillness. whose mind is in a state of stillness. Indeed, such a state is only to be found in those who through their whole manner of life strive to attract divine grace and blessing to themselves. If we seek by guarding our intellect, and by inner watchfulness to engage in noetic work, which is the true philosophy of Christ, we must begin by exercising self-control with regard to our food and eating and drinking as little as possible. So even though we're talking about the mind, or we're talking about watchfulness, we're talking about renouncing the bad thoughts of thin. So a lot of kind of mental spiritual practice we've been talking about here, he comes back to the ascetic practices of the body as well, fasting, eating and drinking as little as possible. But look here at this, I love this beautiful, uh, again, it's similar to the St. Joseph picture is here. Maybe it's Mary holding Christ in her arms, but maybe Joseph's arm, hands blessing, or maybe it's the blessing of the father there behind um, one of his fathers, right? So here Mary is finding her stillness. 
She's finding her stillness in her son, who is the word, who is holding the word. And sometimes, you know, in our prayer lives, we focus too much on actual words. and We don't focus on the silent word, the silent utterance of Christ. Be still and know that I am God. We want the mind to come back to a place of stillness. It's not something to fear. It's not something to fear because the peace of Christ is there. Okay, so this now we're entering into now the, the final section of the presentation tonight, which is um, the section on watchfulness. So this is section five, be sober, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So I'm going to begin the section on watchfulness by quoting uh, St. Theot, who is in volume two. Um, and he, like I said, he's also a Sinite hesychast. And he um, was really an expert also, like Philotheos, he's an expert on the topic of watchfulness. Watchfulness is a spiritual method. So right there, that's important to note. He's not, it's not just theory. It's a spiritual method. It's not just an idea, which completely frees us with God's help from impassioned thoughts. So it frees us from the passions. It leads to a sure knowledge of the inapprehensible God. So it's doing a few things with God's help, right? Like very important to know. With God's help, it frees us from the, the passions. It leads us to knowledge of God. So it does those two things and helps to penetrate the divine and hidden mysteries. Okay. So it gives us wisdom. It, it leads us to God and leads us to his wisdom. It is in the true sense, purity of heart, a state blessed by Christ. When he said, blessed are the clean of heart for they shall see God. So through watchfulness, we cleanse our heart. We cleanse them of what? We cleanse them of the passion, the passionate thoughts. And that leads us to God. Okay, this is so fundamental for Christian life. I'm going to go over it again. You want to know God? He's not going to appear to you one day on your television set. He's not going to come. The, 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 the clouds in the sky are not going to part, part like in that Monty Python, the opening to Monty Python skits. And, and the Lord's going to come down in, in a giant, you know, thunderbolt or something. That's how we're not, not how we're going to meet God. We are going to meet God by cleansing the heart. Jesus says it right here. And remember, he says also that the kingdom of heaven is to be, is, is within you in, in Luke 17, 21. So watchfulness. So the Beatitudes really here, he's quoting from the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the clean of heart for they shall see God. The Beatitudes in general. And like Philotheus has already said, the commandments of Christ in the New Testament are meant to heal the passions, to lead us to God. So continuing watchfulness, it teaches us how to activate the three aspects of our soul correctly, the mind, the emotions and desires watchfulness is a continue here and here he defines what watchfulness is watchfulness is a you know what i don't like what i'm doing there because i'm kind of going through the words let me get a bigger one watchfulness i'm going to use it as a highlighter so watchfulness is a continual fixing and halting of thoughts at the entrance of the heart. It is the heart stillness. But that, but the, the previous line there was really important that watchfulness is a continual fixing and halting of thoughts at the entrance of the heart. So what we're doing is we're, we're taking our gaze within. And yes, the fathers of the church use the heart in the center of the chest as the focus point for meditation. They look within they keep their attention on the heart and whatever thoughts arise into consciousness, they then either 
allow them to be there if they're godly thoughts, if they're thoughts of the Holy Spirit, of the Father, the Son, the Holy Trinity, then fine, you can dwell on that. And if they're thoughts of like, you know, gorging yourself on haagen where you're having like, you know, sex with your neighbor's wife or something, well, those are not thoughts that we're meant to be having. So, you know, we're constantly watching, we're being a, a guardian for ourselves, okay? We're becoming a guardian to ourselves. It is the heart stillness. When we free and when free from mental images, it is the guarding of the intellect. So that, that term is simply synonymous with um, watchfulness, guarding of the intellect, guarding of the heart. And um, there you go. So, so that, that's going back to volume two for Philotheos. And it gives us a sense of what, um, what watchfulness actually is all about. But it turns out that watchfulness actually has, you can ask the question, where does the practice itself come from? Where are these fathers picking up on this? Many people will say, oh, th this is a kind of meditation. It's coming from uh, Buddhism. It's coming from uh, Hare Krishna. It's coming from Satan. Satan is trying to, you know, get you to meditate. So you stop, you know, praying the rosary. Uh, no. The practice of watchfulness comes to us from God. And we read in Exodus 12, verse 42. This is the night of the Exodus. It is the night where the Israelites were putting um, the blood of the lamb upon their doorposts. And, and I didn't quote that part, but the, the blood of the lamb, what the blood of the lamb was doing was the blood of the lamb was um, protecting the Israelites from the angel of death who was coming to them. It was the angel of death was the 10th plague. But the angel, but the, the, the practice of um, the, the putting the blood on the doorpost did not get the Israelites out of Egypt. So then we read in Exodus 1242, it was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So here we see that in fact, how did the Israelites get out of Egypt? Well, it was watching by the Lord doing this practice. And you say, well, that sounds crazy. Well, that's what scripture says. So we're, what we're seeing is that the Lord himself is doing the watching. So this same night is a night of watching kept to the Lord by all the people of Israel throughout all generations. It was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. And what is the land of Egypt on a symbolic level? It's sin. All of the fathers will recognize that Egypt is symbolically interpreted as sin. And so, that, so that's what the story we've been telling so far tonight with Philotheos is that um, the, uh, the, the, the practices of healing the soul is taking us out of the realm of the passions. Okay. So, but what about this bit here where it says, you know, a night of watching kept to the Lord by all the people of Israel throughout all the generations. You know, if you went to my parents' house at Passover for the Seder, you would um, not find them practicing watchfulness. So most Jews wouldn't know what this is today, but there is a Jew who later on in the Bible on the eve of the Passover, on the eve of his own Passover, did practice watchfulness. And that's Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane on the eve of his own passion. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very troubled, even unto death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So, 
could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. So here we have Christ who has gone where? Well, he's crossed over the, um, the Kidron Spring. And my son, Kai, once pointed out, he said, oh, dad, when Jesus passes over the Kidron, that's like when the Israelites go through the Red Sea. And so he, and what is he doing? He's going into a garden. He's taking us back to the garden. He's, he's rolling back the ontology of sin. He's rolling back the history of sinful man who walked out of the garden. And Jesus is taking Peter and the sons of Zebedee back into the garden. And he's saying to them, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Well, what happened in the garden? Adam and Eve fell into temptation. They fell, you know, like we'll give them, a, you know, we'll, well, merciful and compassionate to them, but they fell, right? And it, we know how much suffering it caused. So here Christ is coming back to the garden and he's saying, watch and pray. In order to do what? In order to heal the fall and the rise of the passion that came into the world because we gave in to temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh... There's that word again, the flesh is weak. Okay. Watchfulness is a continual fixing and halting of thoughts at the entrance of the heart. It is the heart's stillness. So for 10, 15 seconds, just very briefly, bring your awareness to your heart. Try to hold it there in stillness. Watchfulness and philothes. Watchfulness purifies the voice of conscience to speak to us of things conducive to salvation that we should do and tells us how to live in conformity with God's will. Watchfulness is both a practice and a state. So watchfulness is this practice of watching the thoughts that are arising in the heart but it is also leads us to the proper state of mind to where that place where the rider gets rain, the reins back. Okay. So when we start to practice watchfulness and we start to discern in our thoughts and we start to come back inside, we gather the scattered mind, we bring it back inside. That doesn't mean we're oblivious to the external world. It just means we're grounded in our own hearts, in our own consciousness. That's part of what it means to heal from the fall. Watchfulness is also referred to as attentiveness and guarding of the heart. It begins as an interior watching of thoughts, but can lead to mystical states of contemplation. Holy, so, so I mentioned, you know, bringing our, our consciousness back in an interior way. The Holy Scripture bears witness to this when it says, if the spirit of the ruler rises against you, do not desert your place. In other words, consciousness, the mind should not desert its place. That's the fall. The fall is when awareness is not where it's supposed to be. The place of the intellect is its firm stand in virtue and its watchfulness. The place of the intellect is its firm stand in virtue and its watchfulness. Be extremely strict in guarding your intellect. When you perceive an evil thought, rebut it and immediately call upon Christ to defend you. 
And while you are still speaking, Jesus in his gentle love will say, Behold, I am by your side, ready to help you. Through remembrance of Jesus Christ, concentrate your scattered intellect. That's not just a piece of good advice. That is necessary for our salvation. Watchfulness may be called a path leading both to the kingdom within us and to that which is to be, while noetic work, which trains and purifies the intellect from an impassioned state to a state of dispassion, is like a window full of light through which God looks, revealing himself to the soul. We must be mindful of God since we have been created for this. Take a few seconds and be mindful of God. Watchfulness is a continual fixing and halting of thoughts the entrance of the heart. Our prayer life needs to start incorporating the practice of watchfulness. You know, if we're just running through the liturgy of the hours or the divine liturgy or the mass or the rosary or the Jesus prayer, if we're not bringing this practice of watchfulness into our prayer lives, we're not praying as we should. Let us go forth with the heart completely attentive and the soul fully conscious. For if attentiveness and prayer are daily and joined together, they become like Elijah's fire-bearing chariot, raising us to heaven. What do I mean? A spiritual heaven the sun, moon, and stars is formed in the heart of one who has reached a state of watchfulness or who strives to attain it for such a heart as the result of mystical contemplation and ascent is able to contain within itself the uncontainable God. Watchfulness cleanses conscience and makes it lucid. Thus cleansed, it shines out like a light that has been uncovered Banishing much darkness. Once this darkness has been banished through constant and genuine watchfulness, the conscience then reveals things hidden from us, how the intellect must avoid being hit and avoid the noxious darkness by hiding itself in Christ, the light for which it longs. He who has tasted this light will understand what I am talking about. The soul is never sated with it, but the more it feeds on it, the more hungry it grows. It is a light that attracts the soul as the sun, the eye. Inexplicable, it becomes explicable through experience. I have been wounded by it, but am silent, even though I want to speak of it. So briefly now towards the end, we're coming to the end of the presentation. I'm gonna just ask a few questions. Is watchfulness a form of Christian meditation? I would say, yes, it is. So the image here is actually not um, one of Michael O'Brien's and you can see the painting by Francis Bennett. Is watchfulness similar to mindfulness? So this I think is a very important question to ask because mindfulness is so prevalent within the culture today. Should Christians practice meditation? Maybe we could ask, should Christians practice mindfulness? Should Christians practice watchfulness? Are, and you know, there's also the question, are there any dangers in meditation? Um, so we'll look now just quickly at a chart. And we'll, this chart will help us to answer some of these questions. So we have mindfulness in um, the yellow band and nepsis or watchfulness in the blue. So the first 
column is asking, is it meditation? And I think we have to say, yes, they both are. Both of them are forms of kind of an interior awareness where we're watching our thoughts. What are their similarities? Well, they both emphasize being present. Nepsis watchfulness is specifically about being present to our thoughts that arise. Mindfulness sometimes is, is described as a meditative practice, but it, sometimes it's described as um, being mindful with whatever we're doing. The, the fathers of the church don't really use watchfulness in that way. Okay, so there's a slight distinction there. So what is the area of focus? Well, in mindfulness, there's a passive awareness of the present moment. And in Nepsis watchfulness, I could think we could say that there's a focused awareness of thoughts that are in the heart. Does mindfulness use prayer? Not in the way it's practiced here in North America. Does watchfulness use prayer? Yes, the fathers do us that we should join the practice of watchfulness to our prayers and specifically to the Jesus prayer. Is there a theological focus? Well, no. Um, in mindfulness, there's no theological focus. And it's really come to be seen as a secular form of meditation. And why do we need theology? Why do we need the church? You can do away with all of that and just be mindful. Um, that is very different. And remember, I had those little um, um, considerations that I was making at the start of this presentation where I said that these writings need to be taken within their fuller context, which is the church. So Nepsis watchfulness has a theological focus and a theological context as well. And that context is the church. So watchfulness is practiced within the context of the church. What is the goal? Well, the deep, in mindfulness, the goal is deeper awareness of the present moment, or maybe constant awareness of the present moment. In Nepsis watchfulness, we could say that the goal is really to heal the passions, attain direct knowledge of God. And I think that's been clear in the presentation tonight. Now, there was the question that we asked, are there dangers in meditation? And I think that the answer has to be that there are. Uh, Cheetah House, and I put the website address below there, it's www.cheetahhouse.org. Cheetah House is an organization, and they, they're a nonprofit organization that provides information and resources about meditation-related difficulties to meditators in distress and providers of teachers of meditation-based modalities. And here on, the, on the, um, the right side of the page, I've actually given you a little testimonial of an individual who ran into some problems while he was meditating. He said, I started having thoughts like, let me take over you, combined with confusion and tons of terror, says David, a polite, articulate 27-year-old who arrived at Britain's Cheetah House in uh, 2013. I had a vision of death with a scythe and a hood and the thought, kill yourself over and over again. Well, this isn't the practice of the remembrance of death. This actually is demonic interference. Now, how much tonight did we look at Philotheo saying the demons introducing thoughts? Well, here they are introducing thoughts. So if you don't have a spiritual father, if you don't, if you aren't using prayer in addition to meditation, if you aren't embedded in the sacramental life of the church where you have confession, where you have um, the, the sacrament of Holy Eucharist, you can run into trouble. So the, the contextuality of the church helps us to prevent this kind of thing from happening. And anybody who is this is happening to them, who's either meditating or not in meditating, but is starting to hear voices and other things. If you are in a confessing church, or, and I mean by that, that you are in a sacramental church that practices confession, please go to confession. Why, are, why has Satan's voice, being, the volume being turned up? Well, that's because of sin. And Gabriella Morth, the chief exorcist of the Vatican, has said that you know, the best protection against the devil 
is going to confession regularly. So yes, there are dangers in practicing meditation, but if one, I believe, I truly believe that if one begins to practice watchfulness, watching the thoughts that are in the heart, and you are, have a regular prayer life, you attend church regularly, you're receiving the body and blood of Jesus Christ, you go to confession regularly, this kind of testimonial probably won't be in your future. How to enshrine God in the heart, where humility is combined with the remembrance of God that is established through the watchfulness and attention, and also with recurrent prayer, inflexible in its resistance to the enemy. There is the place of God. The heaven of the heart in which, because of God's presence, no demonic army desires to make a stand. All is done. I'm just going to read from St. Paul in Ephesians and Corinthians. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. <clears throat> For we have the mind of Christ. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then, in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. The end. Well, I hope you have all enjoyed my presentation on Philotheos tonight. And we will post more of our presentations on the fathers of the Philokalia. We do have a, um, a Philokalia study group that meets on Zoom once a month. Uh, if you're interested in joining it, um, you can send me an email. My email address is sgmetanoia, sgmetanoia at gmail.com. And you can come and join our Philokalia study group. We usually meet the last Friday of the month. This Thursday, we are going to, again, have a wonderful call with Bishop Brian Beta and Father Peter Schimelda on asking the question whether or not we're in the end times. Um, so hope you've enjoyed my presentation tonight, and uh, please like it if you do, and we will talk to you soon.